Hi everyone, uh, this is Steven with Vital Entertainment Studio. Uh, I wanted to record a video for you to help you in learning to play Infinity's Defiance of Fate. And what we'll do is uh, go through some of the core concepts of the game. Uh, once I go through those, we get an idea of the game flow. I'll get to some more specifics. And then uh, we're gonna look at a couple sample rounds using skirmish mode. That way you can see everything in action. So with Infinities, this is meant to be a streamlined version of a 4X. We call it 4X Lite. And you can have one to four players playing. There's certainly solo modes available. You have your campaign through story. And of course, you have competitive skirmish. In the game, you're going to have a leader. You're going to have cards, which have two types we'll get into. You have your action dice, which will determine what you can do during your turns. And there's also HP dice that will help uh, track the health of your units that have joined your leader. And all of this is happening as we have a science fiction and fantasy uh, melding of worlds together in a multiverse setting. So let's talk real quick about these components in more detail. So your leader is going to serve as your avatar in the world, if you will. Uh, you'll have the board itself, and of course you'll have the standees, uh, which represent your leader as you're moving around the, the map of the world. And so as you see here, I've got this set up. You start usually in skirmish with a rift, and then the characters kind of pop out of that rift using some of the regions of their world represented by the hex tiles. So there's going to be two of these stacks. You've got one for Sands of Vara, which is where Driat comes from. You've got one for the Genesis circuit, which is where G35C happens to come from. And you'll start in there, but you can certainly cross uh, over to the other worlds. Uh, it doesn't matter where you came from. You also are going to have some tokens here. These will be used for area control on the map. These are your control tokens. You also have a trigger resource. That's used for a couple of things. One, it's used for uh, expending this to control tiles, but also expending this to use uh, unique reactions from your leader if people are destroying the assets you have on the table. So the actual game flow of Infinities is actually pretty simple. And what I would highly recommend is that as you're learning the game, uh, go use that uh, that core concepts page in the rule book. There's, there's the game overview section that starts on three and moves over to four. It really gives you a lot of the essentials uh, to understand the logic of the game, the, the language of the game, if you will. The other thing I would say is that if you're teaching the game to other people, really lean into using the reference card. The reference card is double-sided. It covers the structure of rounds, all of the basic actions that are available for you, what the basic reaction is, and then also really important, uh, what are the tile events? Because they're not printed on the tiles themselves, so you do need to know what those three events are. Uh, how do dice checks work? And then of course, a little bit of an icon legendary. So this is a great, great learning tool and just reference uh, reference tool as well for new players and also those that are just still uh, getting their bearings, you know, those first one, two, three games into infinities. Uh, so what we're going to do is just kind of set up a little sample map situation here. Uh, so when you're setting up uh, your, your map at the beginning, we're going to pull from the world that we currently exist in and we will look at the influence, which is the number on the tile. And we're going to look for whichever side is higher. You'll see that uh, there's a top and a bottom indicator for the tiles. This is going to come into play in some of the chapters that you have in story mode and also some of the quests. But at the beginning of the game, you find whichever side has the highest number and set that aside. Let me get my my Driac standee out. And I'll also get the one out for my Cable Leviathan over here. That way we're all set up. So it looks like uh, Driac's going to have a three and we've got a five here for the Cable Leviathan. So he's going to choose uh, first where to put his standee, where to put his tile. You'll notice that these, these tiles have these lines on them that match the color, match their type. These are walls. And so typically speaking, walls are going to be preventing your normal movement. It goes its full distance. But also there's a lot of elements uh, in the game, in fact, most of them, that require you to have a path of reach on people. And we'll see that as we get into play here. So I'll just go ahead and have Driac put this. So there's no walls touching the rift. That way we've got a clear shot at each other. You'll also go ahead and start with control of your starting tile. So I'll get that set up here. So with this, when you control tiles that have either the red, blue, or green icon, so that would be red for power, green for energy, I'm sorry, green for agility, blue for energy, uh, that's going to level up your leader. That's what these cubes are here for. These are going to give you some passive bonuses throughout the game. And they'll also help you roll additional dice in checks. You'll see there's indications here on how many dice you'll roll for things like attack checks or powering up cards or you know even for your reaction over here on the right side of your board. So since Driac has controlled a green tile, he is going to currently have an additional level in his agility track. Uh, this will, of course, go down if he loses it. So this is, this is a state-based leveling system. It's not like uh, every time you get one, you go up. 
and you can sort of like max out and control way, way more than you have to. Um, really, you just need to control three of any given type in order to have a maxed out stat, but if you lose it, you know, you're going to go down. Uh, if you look here, uh, we don't have a red, a blue, or a green for the Cable Leviathan. He has a purple tile, a will tile. So the will tiles, they're not going to give you any levels here. What the will tile does do, though, if you, uh, if you take a look at the check section on your reference card, if you're following along with, with your components at home, for each will tile that you control, when you're making uh, dice checks, any will result, which is a one, you can reroll one per will tile you control. So if you make a check with three dice and all of them come up will, and you control three will tiles, you can reroll all of them one time. So it's a nice little luck mitigating factor uh, that the Cable Leviathan would start the game out with. So let's talk a little bit about, uh, about game flow here. The way that the game works is actually pretty simple, as I said. What you're going to do is you're going to look at the icon that's on your tile, in this case it's agility here, and you're going to put one of your dice on your board, that's called locking it in. And so I've got an agility here for Driac, and I'll put a will tile here, since that is the type for the Cable Leviathan, he's going to get that. So again, if you're following along on your, on your reference card, that's the start phase, we've locked in a die. We're going to then move to the roll phase. This is where we are going to roll the remaining action dice we have. We have an option once that happens. You can either choose to lock all three of those in, or re-roll all three of those and then lock them in. It's, it's a binary decision at that point. You can't say, oh, I want to keep these two and re-roll one of them. Nope, it's all or nothing. Uh, re-roll all of them or keep them. So just do that real quick here with both of our leaders. And so for Driac, this is a pretty uh, pretty majority agility turn. And we'll get into what the basic actions do. I, I just want to show you kind of how the, the round structure works with the dice. So he could say, well, I don't know if I want so many of the same, so he can re-roll them all. But now he's going to have to live with whatever happens. In this case, he ends up with a lot of boosts. And so that, that can be good, uh, but also for some people that might be a bit of a bummer. If we come over to the Leviathan, he's going to roll his. And see, he's got two boosts as well, so maybe he's going to give that a retry. Again, you only get one time to, to do that to re-roll. Now he's got a, a little bit more of a diverse uh, set of actions available for him. So that then gets us through the roll phase. That's phase two of a round. Phase three is where the meat of the game occurs, the bulk of it, right? This is where we start getting into the interactions with each other, interactions with the map, of course, and moving into, you know, going towards objectives, whether that's in skirmish mode or in story mode. So let's talk for a little bit about these basic actions, because this is going to be what you use most of the time, but certainly there's other actions available that we'll get into. So let's kind of go uh, from top to bottom here. So with your energy dice during your, during your action phase, this is going to let you play cards from your hand or from your timeline. Let's talk about what that means. Uh, so number one, there's two kinds of cards. You have your unit cards. These are indicated, you can see a defense value and an HP value on them. Uh, these, are, these are characters that are going to join your leader. So when you use that energy die to play them, they're going to go up here above your leader to join their group. So you can see here you have a standard of three. This is also indicated on your leaderboard here with your limit. But you can see it's expandable to a fourth. And that will happen here on your agility track. You see that little indicator here that they filled in a fourth slot. That means you could then have four units at one time rather than three. So when a unit is up here, it's going to give you a special new action, sort of like an expansion to your options. So not only could you use energy to play cards, you now with a Dragon Fist Monk in your group could use energy to attack units. And so units are a way to have more options available during a round. So you could certainly play a unit to there. You could also play an action card, and action cards are one-shots. So in this case, you've got Mirage, which lets you move around some control tokens uh, from the Davis side. You've got some control token destruction on this particular action card. Basically, the way that these work is you would play them from your hand or play them from your timeline, which I'm going to talk about in just a second, and resolve their effects. Once everything is resolved, they go straight to the discard pile. Okay. So let's talk about that timeline. At the beginning of the game, when we get all set up here for the skirmish, we're going to get a hand of four cards. One of those we can go ahead and put over here to the right of our board. That's our timeline. And you can see here, again, there's an indicator on your leaderboard. If you look at the top right, you can have three cards in there, and that's expandable to a fourth. Again, very similar. It's on that level three, but this is for energy. That's how you expand that one. So what's the timeline doing over there? Well, the timeline's a place where you can kind of reserve cards for future play. Because at the end of rounds, you're going to have to cycle some cards out of your hand. So cards in your hand aren't permanent. The timeline's a place where they can be a little bit more permanent. So what would happen is... If during setup, at the beginning of the game, or, or during the game at the ends of rounds, I could be putting cards over here to kind of save them for later. And I can play them using the basic energy action once again. It says play a card from your hand or your timeline. Think of it, it's basically a second hand, but it's a hand that everyone can see. Uh, the other cool thing about the timeline, though, is that if you take a look at the Dragon Fist Monk, he's got an effect that says prepared. So the act of putting cards in the timeline is not playing them, it's called preparing them. While this card is prepared, it gets a bonus effect. So that's something you want to look for at the beginning of the game, but also during the game. Uh, what cards do I actually save in that timeline, and are they going to convey any sort of 
bonuses for me. The same thing happens here with repressed hostility. It also has a prepared bonus. Okay, so the timeline is a great place for you to, number one, save uh, cards that would otherwise have to be discarded, and number two, actually empower yourself with passive effects. So that's generally speaking what's going to happen with your energy action. Again, if you're following along your reference card here. Then you go down to your power action, which is attacking. So this is going to allow us a chance to talk a little bit about checks. So if you're going to attack a unit, it must be in a group. So a group means it's right here, above a leader. So let's say Drex got this. Uh, this unit over here, and this unit has seven defense, two HP. Right now, the Cable Leviathan, if you wanted to roll an attack, uh, you'll see here on the reference card, it says to roll a little red circle with the power symbol in it. That means a power check. Okay, uh, That's, of course, referred to on this checks bit on the bottom half of the, of the, uh, the back of the reference card. So if you roll a power check, uh, you are going to look at your column here for power. And then check over to the right, how many dice do I roll? Well, I'm at level one, so I, for power, I roll one die. So here's how this would work. You would take either, if you've got all of your dice locked in, you don't have a free one, uh, you can borrow one from, there's that fifth player bin, so we can borrow a die. You can, of course, use your HP dice as well if you don't have any free dice that have already been spent. Because certainly you don't want to roll those and have to memorize them. So I only have one die to roll. Unfortunately, these are six-sided dice with numbers on them, so I can't get a seven. I'm not going to be able to hit this Dragon Fist monk. Uh, let's just say for the sake of argument, someone's attacking an Agent of Diva instead. So the way that these will work is in a check, there's going to be a target you're trying to reach. And the target is going to be uh, you looking at the number on the die that you roll and hoping that you can meet or beat that value. In the case of an attack, the difficulty is set by the defense of the unit. In this case, for Agent of Diva, it's a, it's a four. So if I roll my single die and I don't get this, I have failed the check. So my attack doesn't do anything, the agent's all clear. If, however, let's say I roll uh, a five, for instance. If I roll a five, that means I've met or I've beaten the difficulty of my attack check and I can do one HP of damage. Uh, so for this unit, that means you can see it's got one HP, this is gonna die, the unit is going to be destroyed. But you can see there's other units that have two HP, there's even somewhat three, four, and five HP and six HP. So let's say uh, I did have enough dice to be attacking this Dragon Fist Monk. If I could roll a seven or better, I would do one damage to it. If I can roll a 14 or better, I can do both of its HP and damage. So basically the difficulty is each time you meet the difficulty, you do damage. So you can see this is a pretty tanky unit. You're gonna need a lot of dice for that. So that's essentially how an attack would work. And these HP dice, let's say I roll an eight on a check, just for example, attacking the Dragon Fist Monk. That's gonna do one damage to it. It's gonna reduce its HP by one. And so this is where your HP tracking dice are gonna come into play. You can put it right there. That way we can indicate that damage being done. There's certainly effects that allow you to heal those units back up, but their maximum HP is always whatever is printed on their card. And while they're at their maximum, I would recommend uh, go ahead and keep those HP dice off of them just uh, so they're available for other uses, um, but also it's already printed on the card, so the information's there for you. So that is your attack option and your basic actions. Uh, then you've got, uh, I guess, probably the, mo the most complicated of your basic actions would be your movement, because then we start interacting with the map quite a bit. So you can either move two spaces, uh, as long as you've got no walls in your way, or you can do a half movement, which is one space and let you move through a wall. And as you're doing this, if you enter tiles that don't have control tokens, this is where we can start spending the trigger resource to control tiles, either to gain attributes or to gain some of those rerolls, like we mentioned with uh, with the will that the Cable Leviathan has. This lets him do some rerolls on his checks. Uh, and also the boost tiles, which are the white bordered ones that let you do something special too. So let's just uh, talk about this for a second movement wise. So Dreak does have movement available here. So just as an example, if he wanted to move, he's currently sitting in a Sands of Varatel, and you can see that by this indicator here at the top. He can discover new tiles, and if he does so, it's going to be from the world he's currently standing in. So he'll place a tile from that stack adjacent to him. Now, when you're discovering, unless you're in some sort of a chapter or quest that says otherwise, you get to pick which side of the tile you use. And you can see that they have the same walls, but different types. They also have different influence levels. So let's say he wants to do a full-on movement, two spaces. He would go ahead and place that tile in a way that there's no walls. He can move into this first one. And just for the sake of argument, we can come over here and he could spend one of his triggers to control it. Okay. And let's say he wants to move again, of course. He can bring this tile out, take a look at both sides, and decide, okay, I want to go into power because I'd really like to get some attributes built up here. He'll spend a second trigger put a token on that power tile, and now that he's controlled a power, he will increase that to two. Okay, Again, that's going to make him, we just talked about attacks, now that he's got level two power, his attacks will do two dice for the checks, so he's a little stronger there when it comes to attacking. And give this guy his die back. 
So that is a normal two space movement with discovering tiles. Now you could also be doing some interesting things like, um, and so if you went instead to the rift, right, you can control the rift, first of all. Uh, and second of all, when you exit the rift, there's there's no other rift tiles. So it's not like you can pull from a same stack like, like he did with Farah. So when you exit the rift, you get to choose either world to pull that tile from. So he could go into the rift and start discovering tiles from the Genesis circuit if he wanted. That's, that's available for anybody when they move. Uh, the question, of course, arises, what happens if, let's say, for instance, the Cable of Ithan controls a tile that Driak enters? Can he just walk in there and overwrite and control it? No, he can't. Um, he, the tile either needs to be uncontrolled or he needs to have some sort of a card or a leader effect that says specifically to control a tile, and that will let him overwrite. So when you're just wandering around, moving about the map, your control is going to be limited mostly to uncontrolled tiles. So that's the basics of, of your movement for your agility basic action. Your boost basic action is going to let you spend that die, that boost die, to convert one of your other dice to whatever face you feel like. So let's say, you know what, Driak really, really wants to do some attacking uh, on the current round. He could spend one of these to change this to a power, for example. Uh, sort of an early tip in the game, I would say, is when you're doing conversions, unless you really have a specific use, like maybe there's a unit card that requires, like this guy requires power, right, to use his action. This one re requires energy to use the Dragon Fist Monk action. Unless you have something particular in mind, it might be a good idea when you're doing conversions to change to, to will. Uh, why is that? Well, that's going to be the next action we look at. For the will face on your, on your dice, it lets you use any of those other four basic actions. So a will die can have you play a card, you can attack a unit, you can move around, you can convert dice. Uh, all of those options are available. And those are great because if you do that conversion and then your opponent kind of pivots on you and then, well, all of a sudden that plan isn't going to work out, well, that can be something else. So Driak, yeah, he wanted to attack, but maybe his opponent, you know, gets in a defensive position where we can't quite get to him. Uh, then he can use it to play a card or then he can chase, he can move uh, to, to give chase. So it's not always the best move, but oftentimes changing to will is, is pretty strong. The other thing you can do, of course, is any of the dice can be used to rest, and that'll help you regain some triggers here. So you'll just burn a die, spend it off, put it, put it to the side of your, to your board, and then you'll get two triggers back, and that will be a rest action. So those are all of your basic actions. So let's just uh, talk about how that happens in a round. Uh, you have to do actions one action per player at a time. So just for the sake of argument, we're not going to play these things out, but it's kind of to show you. Uh, let's say Driak wants to change this die to a will. That's his turn. He then passes it to the Cable of Ithan here who says, well, you know what? I'm going to play a card for my hand. He plays a card, resolves it, or he puts the unit in his group. And then passes back to Driak. Driak says, okay, you played a card, I'm going to play a card. So Driak then plays a card from his hand or from his timeline. Coming back to the Cable of Ithan, he says, oh, I've got another card I want to play. He puts another one out. Resolves it, finishes his turn, comes back to Driak. Driak says, okay, time for me to move and start controlling some tiles, like we had kind of done here in our example. He does that, resolves all of his movement. Uh, again, that can be two spaces if he's moving, uh, as long as he's not going through walls. Uh, Cable of Ithan says, well, you know, you moved, so am I. He decides he's going to spend an agility. He's going to move around. Driak says, okay, well, I've got myself in position. I'm going to attack one of those units that you played out there. He does it, resolves it. Good, bad, or ugly. The attack is done. We pass the turn. Cable of Ithan says, okay, well, you know what? I've got a third card I actually want to play. I'm going to spend this will to play a card. And he does so, puts another card out. Maybe Driak uh, destroyed his unit. He replenishes it with another one. At this point, both of our players have all of their dice spent. And so... If we look at our reference card, again, I think this is a tool that you should definitely use as you're learning the game, keep coming back to it. You'll see that phase three, the action phase, we're done with it, okay? Uh, as far as the dice go, they're done. Uh, you then go to the end phase. This is when we get into some of the things I was talking about when it comes to uh, resetting the hand. So you'll see here, if I've got cards left in my hand, I get to put one in my timeline, if I wish, to kind of preserve it. This is that prepare uh, keyword we're talking about. You can prepare one of the cards, Everything else that was in your hand has to go, though. So you'll discard it, and then you'll draw back to three cards. This is also, as you can see in the text here, under in phase 4A, this is where you can get some triggers from controlling boost tiles. So if you remember, I was talking about controlling will tiles gives you rerolls. Controlling boost tiles, like this one here, boost tiles will give you, for each one you control, at the end of the round, you get one trigger. So it's a great source of income. So that's something that happens here in the end phase when you're doing your reset. This is also where something that's somewhat complicated occurs, which is the rift. The rift is going to be this representation of a distortion in space-time. And so each of the tile faces are reflecting that. 
So with the rift on the map, typically it's the last player. If you want to have someone designated to do it other than that, that's perfectly fine. It's your table. You play it how you want. But that person's going to roll a die, and then they're going to flip all the tiles whose type matches the result. So just as an example here, let's take this die. So I've got a few different tile types out here. If we roll this die, you see it comes up energy. If that's the case, nothing happens. There's, you see there's no blue tiles on the board, no energy tiles. Let's just say for the sake of argument, it was agility comes up. Let's say the rift flares up, we roll the die, and agility comes up. So even though someone is standing in it, this tile is going to flip over. You see right now it's on its bottom face. You can also see that the orientation of the name looks like this. We want to keep it that way when we flip it over. That way the walls are in the same uh, positions. So if you look, we go there. The name's in the same spot. Walls are in the same spots. Actually, this tile has the same uh, same type. However, you'll notice that the influence has dropped here. And we'll get into what why that's important right here in a second. So that tile flips. We're done with the rift. Okay. But this can mean, let's say that that's, that face did change. Uh, let's say... Um, Let's say it was power instead that rolled. And Driak had a power control. You know, we talked about he went up to level two in his power. If that flips over, that's no longer power. So he would go to his track and he would level that down because he no longer has that power tile control because it doesn't exist anymore. So the rift, you know, if you're thinking about the end phase, this is why we have in end phase 4C on your reference card. Make sure that you adjust your attribute tracks and then we're going to talk about turn order in just a second uh, to reflect what happened with the rift. It's also important, especially when you start getting a big map, be deliberate in how you're doing your flipping and checking on the map. Uh, so kind of do like a top to bottom, left to right, or have some sort of, a, of an idea of, of order to it. So then let's talk about this last part of the end phase, which is turn order. Now turn order is something that during the setup of the game, we would get established, and we would get it established based on that influence number on the tiles. And so if you remember, when we started the game, Drak was on a three, and the, um, sorry, the Cable Leviathan was on a five, and that's why he got to place his tile down first. He also gets first dibs on taking actions during the phases of the, of the round. So currently, the turn order is five and three, so red and white. You've got a place to keep track of this. And so let's take a look over at this area of the table. I'll put some tokens over there. And you'll see you've got that game state mat in your box. This tells you that you're setting this by descending order of influence and alphabetical order will break ties. So if you had two people in threes, but someone's tile starts with an A in its name and the other one starts with an S, the A would be first. Okay. Uh, so this is where you can keep track of turn order. And if that changes because of the rift, you would just then shift those tokens around. Okay. The, the uh, game state map's also a place where you'll keep track of your score using these markers. So since we're going to play a skirmish here in a little bit, I'll go ahead and get our markers set up uh, anyway. So we'll have them both over there. I guess I could have used these tokens, but it's okay. So we've got a round that we've basically done top to bottom. So just to kind of recap, at the beginning of the round, you put one die onto your leaderboard that matches whatever tile type you're in. You then roll three dice, choose to re-roll those three or keep them, put them on your board, and then you go back and forth with player by player doing actions one at a time until you're out. Uh, you then end the round by resetting the hands, replenishing triggers if you've got some controls there, do the rift event, adjust your tracks, adjust turn order, and then also if there's any objectives that deal with the end of the round, that's where they'll, where they'll occur. So that is the basic round structure. That's that's the game flow of Infinities. And I, I did go into some details on a couple things there. One thing I didn't, because it, it kind of happens out of sequence, is the reaction. So let's talk about that. Again, if you're following along your reference card, it's in the bottom. For the reaction, this is where someone has destroyed something that belongs to you when they took their action on their turn. So if they spent a die and they did something that either destroyed your card or maybe they wiped your token off the board, you can spend a trigger, which is that resource again in the bottom right of your board. You can spend a trigger to either do the basic reaction. You can see on the reference card here, you draw two cards and then you roll. You'll see the circle with the agility icon in it. That means a check in the parentheses that five is the difficulty. So you'd roll however many dice your agility track gives you. So Driak, he would roll two dice because remember he started in a green tile. So he would roll two dice. If he can get a five row better, let's just do it for the sake of demonstration. Uh, he did not. Uh, it looks like he got a four because we've got a two and a two. But if he did, he could have gained some triggers back. So whenever you do re your reaction, you do have to spend a trigger to activate it. Now, the neat thing here is you've got the basic one, but your leader, in addition to having its own actions that are available to you during the round, just like the ones that units give you, your leader always has some special actions available that they can spend their dice on for their turn. They also have their reaction. So in this case, Driak can spend his trigger to warp to a tile. Uh, and that would be you know, any tile that's within his reach. And you'll see that reach is referenced on your card. That's your tile plus three. You can extend that to four, just like those other limits. So he can warp to a tile, kind of where he feels like. If he can pass an agility check of a 10, he can also do sort of a, a mass destruction of uh, control tokens. Uh, 
if, as long as they match a certain type that he picks. So when people destroy things on their turn, you can you can do something in response. Now the, the kind of the catch here is, you know, especially you know if you look at the phrasing, it's if their action destroys your belongings. Uh, so if someone does an action, and then let's say Driak does that warp and destroys some of that opponent's tokens in his reaction, that opponent couldn't then react to the reaction. You can only react to actions. Okay, these can happen off turn certainly, and well they have to happen off turn because they're happening because someone else destroyed uh, on their turn. So that's something else that can be going on that interrupts the flow of the turn uh, of the round. So that is essentially uh, a round of infinities. Uh, one thing that we didn't really talk about are the tile events. These are things that uh, I guess we can say that's like once you're getting an understanding of moving around, you can start thinking about positioning. Uh, these are kind of exceptions to rules that you can have while you're on the board. You'll see that if you're in a blue tile, an energy tile, it lets you spend whatever dice you want to play cards from your hand or from your timeline. So it's almost like anything is a wild when it comes to playing cards. If you are in uh, power tiles, you get to ignore all the walls that are on the whole map. It's like you have infrared vision and also you're like a, you go intangible. You can move through walls uh, and still use your full movement. If you are in a, an agility tile, when you leave it, you can warp around. Again, that's going to require your reach. So your space, your space plus three. But when you warp, you go into the tile and you can control uh, the, the tile that you land in if someone else does. You have to spend your trigger, but it's a nice way to sort of kind of play some hopscotch around the board, go from like agility tile to agility tile, and then stomp on someone's control token and take it over. So those are the three tile events that you need to, to remember. But this reference card, this is your friend when it comes to remembering what to do, what order to do it in, and, and maybe what some of your limitations are. But in essence, that is that is the language of the game. That is the logic. That's how a round works. Uh, doesn't matter if you're playing a skirmish, doesn't matter if you're playing in a story, uh, you are locking in dice, you are spending them to do actions, and you are doing hand resets at the end of each round.